Hello, everyone. My name is Lindsay Ojok, and I am part of the Skull Foundation team. We're so excited to welcome you today to this Skull World Forum session, Mobilizing Movements in the Modern World. We're deeply honored to have an inspiring and impressive group of speakers here to learn from and engage with. I wanted to share a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. One, we would like you to know that the session is being recorded and will be released publicly after the event so that you can watch it back over and over again. Language translation is available for this session and you can access this on the translation tab to the right of your video screen. We encourage you to use the chat throughout the session to engage with one another and ask questions from our speakers. Our moderator will be integrating those questions throughout the session. On social media, we're using the hashtag SkullWF, and we invite you to do the same. After the session, you can join small group roundtable discussions on related topics by clicking the Discuss and Meet Up button on the left side of your video screen. With that, I'm thrilled to turn it over to the amazing Pat Mitchell, the founder and president of Pat Mitchell Media, who will introduce this session. Thank you, Lindsay, and good afternoon, morning, SCO World Forum colleagues. I'm joining you today from Dublin, Ireland, a place where you often hear the phrase hope and history rhyme. I'm thinking a lot about what that means to all of us as a global community as we're facing historic levels of challenges and crises and struggling to find the hope that is necessary to confront the challenges with actions and optimism that can lead to change and shape a different kind of future. We know that hope is essential for all movements of change. Every year at the Skull World Forum, my hope is restored by the voices that we hear, by the innovative solutions we learn about, by the people who are facing forward toward the future, creating a different kind of future. And increasingly every year at this time and at all other times, those voices are from a new generation of leadership on the front lines of change, across geographies, across generations. That is the hope for the future. Sharing the learning, what is our role? What is their role? How do we recognize the purpose, the determination, the preparation of young activists everywhere who are demanding a place at all decision-making tables so that they can change the present they have inherited and face forward to a new future. That is our hope of unstoppable global collaboration between and among all generations and geographies and to lead this important conversation that will help us understand better how we move forward together like this is a leader whose leadership I am deeply grateful for, Kumi Kaidu. Kumi, over to you. Thank you very much, Pat, and warmest greetings, friends, colleagues, wherever you are joining us in the world. We are so happy to have you with us. Uh, this morning, afternoon, depending where you are. Um, our discussion today is on mobilizing movements in the modern world. This discussion is of critical importance because in reality, humanity has entered the most critical decade in its existence. Even though there are amazing examples of contagious courage resistance to injustice and people fighting for the survival of their children and their children's future, if we are brutally honest with ourselves, our activism is not winning fast enough or big enough. We are winning very important battles all the time, but we are losing the overall fight for social, economic and environmental justice, among other pressing issues. The crystal clear warnings from science and the increase in extreme weather events are saying this to us very eloquently. However, from Twitter to TikTok, young people across the globe leverage tools and technology to reclaim and rewrite narratives, to connect, educate, and inspire, and to mobilize mass movements towards solutions for some of the world's most pressing problems. 
This session explores the connection to learn how we can build movements in an increasingly connected world. From intersectional organizing to the role of intergenerational relations and shared wisdom, we hope in the session to find reasons for hope and learn how to engage across generational divides. I want to remind everybody of a quotation from one of my mentors and heroes, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, when he used to proudly proclaim himself as a prisoner of hope. And I would put it in a similar way, and I would say pessimism today is a luxury we simply cannot afford. And as it's been said in the past, the pessimism of our analysis can best be overcome by the optimism of our actions. And it's in that spirit I'm so happy that we have four amazing panelists who've been asked to share a little bit about themselves, what are the issues and questions animating their work, what are some of the biggest challenges they see young people facing, and to offer a story about how they address this in their mobilizing efforts, and a few words about how we can address these challenges moving forward. Our first panelist is Ana Ferreira. Ana has a Bachelor in Liberal Studies at the Universidad Metropolitana in Caracas, Venezuela. She currently serves as the Director of Female Leadership in the NGO Proyecta Base. Founder of El Seculo, a Latin American female leadership uh, think tank with participants from seven countries, thriving to cooperate and promote active women's leadership and critical mass in the region shared on, based on shared perspectives. She's also the member of the Civicus Youth Actions Team, and she has ex exercised leadership roles in the National Student Movement of Venezuela for four years and has designed and implemented non-violent practices and protocols for over 40 student protests with over 1 million participants from 2017 to 2019. So it's with great pleasure I turn the floor over now to Anna. Thank you so much. Uh, to begin with, uh, the thriving question of what it's like to be a young activist. Uh, I'm gonna ask a question that is the question that started all for me and for many activists in my country. And it is, are you willing to die for your cause? The first time I answered this question, I was 17 years old uh, and I was actually living in Denmark. Everything was perfect. Well, in my country, students were taking the streets to demand justice and base human rights. My answer to the question was yes, I was willing to die for my cause. So I returned, returned to the uncertainty of Venezuela. But are you really willing to die for your cause? The second time I answered that question, it was 20 years old, now leading the movement I once saw on television. And one of my classmates at that time, uh, his name was Juan Pernalete, was killed due to the impact of a tear gas grenade. We were wearing the same shirts, we were doing the same things, just at different times and different places. It could have been any of us, but so it was in every protest. We protested for over 100 days. And in every single time we, we reached the streets, at least one young, young activist was killed by police forces. How did all this action ended, all this youth action ended? It ended up in negotiation tables we didn't have participation in, and and that for political interest, we were not related to. And two years later, they asked us to do it all over again. So that's the big question for us. It's now time to reframe it and to see how we are not willing to die for our cause. The much harder part is to live for our cause. Mobilizing people in the streets, even when it is millions, it's useless if we lack infrastructures, clear indicators of victories, funding, and long-term strategy. And that is exactly what I'm currently working on building. It is not easy to promote democracy when you and your generation were born and live in a dictatorship. It's not easy to promote inclusion when issues like women's rights are seen as a first world problem and not of discussion in, in a country such as mine. The work focuses on finding connections between local, regional, and global activists to nurture action, 
based on perspective. We shouldn't be in the need to be pushed to those extremes, to face death so closely in order to realize the true value of young activists. We're not target aims, we are minds, we're voices, we're people. So in that sense, it is clearly uh, frustrating the current tools young activists have to travel the uncertainty of our fields of action. Imagine you're making a meal and you decide the steps to follow, you gather the ingredients, you cook everything with perfect care and thought, and just when you're about to take a bite, someone takes it away. In return, you might never see your meal again. What is delivered might not be what you cooked, or by the time it is done, the ingredients might be spoiled or of no use. What I describe is a picture of the frustration of being a young activist, but it is impossible to understand it without the context that in all of that process, lives are being risked. So in that sense, knowing and understanding the obstacles or of being a young activist, what can we do to change that? What can we do so that next generations don't have to face such hard questions by putting your life at risk by only for promoting action in something we believe in? There are, for me, three main things we need to think about. The first one is to fix the instrumentalization of our actions, the imposed agendas, the no place in decision making. We are used to legitimize someone's agenda, but at the end, we are not part of the solution at, uh, in, in its building. So the solution for that is to build more intergenera intergenerational connections. We, are, we as youth, we are not an homogeneous group. We are present in every field of interest, and in that sense, including youth, not only in the beginning of the processes, but in the middle and at the end, and in this decision making, it's something that can nurture not only the decision making itself, but it can build a critical mass of youth that is involved and believes in infrastructure and believes in institutionalization. A second point is innovation. We need to tackle how we access media. In Venezuela, censorship is one of our main obstacles. So we need to think about how we're shifting power towards platforms in a way that sometimes most countries don't have uh, electricity or internet and it becomes isolated activism. In that sense, that's a huge challenge of our generation, how we can face the, the, the technology as an opportunity, both as a challenge and as an opportunity. And the last point is the funding, not only to support movements, but to, to support people. People, uh, young people, they find a vision of their life in these causes. And grassroots movements transform constantly. Uh, we need to follow that transformation more closely and not only see it as something isolated from institutions and to connections. We need to listen and we need to be open to transformation. Thank you. And thank you for reminding us in particular that the struggle for justice is a marathon and not a sprint, and that we need to have a mentality that we need to be giving everything of ourselves in this moment of crisis. Also, I just want to lift up the key point you make about the challenge that we have to communicate our messages because of a very corporatized and state-dominated media environment where the messages of justice cannot be heard as it should be. Um, and, and, and so while we're in the global south, let's move uh, to um, Vanessa Nkate in Uganda now. And it's my great pleasure to invite Vanessa, who's a 25-year climate justice activist from Uganda and the founder of the Africa-based Rise Up movement. She began striking for the climate in her hometown of Kampala in January 2019, after witnessing droughts and flooding devastating uh, uh, communities in Uganda. She now campaigns internationally to highlight the impacts of climate change, already 
playing out in Africa, as well as promoting key climate solutions such as educating girls. In 2020, Vanessa was named a UN Young Leader for the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as being listed one of the BBC's 100 Women of the Year and one of the most 100 influential young Africans. But if I can just embarrass Vanessa before I give her the floor by saying the thing that I, uh, I, I have to make a confession that being an African and seeing the role that Vanessa plays as a young person is such a source of joy to me. But my embarrassment comes here from the fact that sometimes we can't even enjoy this pride we have with this amazing young woman in the global movement because when she goes to the places of World Economic Forum, they'll take a photograph of all the leadership. And even though she's only the person, one person of color there, when the uh, photograph gets published, she's cut out of the photograph. But anyway, on that cheery note, Vanessa, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Kumi and everyone else. Hi, my name is Vanessa Nakate, and I am a climate justice activist from Kampala in Uganda, a country that has one of the fastest changing climates in the world. And as we've heard, I started to strike for the climate after seeing how much the climate crisis was impacting the lives of the people in my country. And because of the changes in the weather, the, the weather patterns, we were receiving extreme rainfall and extreme dry seasons causing the droughts and the flooding and the landslides in different parts of the country. And my country, Uganda, is one uh, that heavily depends on agriculture, you know, for the survival of so many people, of so many communities. So a lack of rain means hunger and starvation for so many people. And too much rainfall means destruction of farms, destruction of homes, and even schools. But this doesn't, you know, just end in Uganda. It goes across the different African countries and the African continent historically is responsible for less than 4% of the global emissions. But we are seeing how much Africa is being impacted by the climate crisis. We've seen the occurrence of floods, we've seen the occurrence of you know, cyclones that have ripped apart large parts of the African continent. We recently saw the tropical storm Anna that left over 80 people dead and left houses and schools and power lines destroyed. And we also saw the Eastern Africa drought that left more than 26 million people with no access to food and no access to water. So the climate crisis in Africa is not something that is coming in the future. It is something that is happening right now. We saw the occurrence of Cyclone Idai in 2019 that ripped apart large parts of Africa and left more than 1,300 people dead and many more were recorded as missing. So the climate crisis means the loss of lives. The climate crisis means the destruction of property, the loss of homes and the loss of schools. And that's why we believe that the climate, you know, climate change is more than weather. We believe it's more than statistics. It's about the people and how people are being impacted. Because as global temperatures continue to rise, people struggle to find food to eat. As the temperatures continue to rise, people struggle to access water. As the temperatures continue to rise, children continue to drop out of school and many girls continue to be forced into early marriages. So when we talk about climate justice, it is not just for the planet. It is not just to reduce on the greenhouse gas emissions, but it's also for the people who are being impacted heavily by the climate crisis. We've seen the losses and damages that are happening across the African continent. And we know there is a need to acknowledge that loss and damage is happening right now, beyond it just being a, a dialogue, but actually for a facility to be put in place for the vulnerable nations to the climate crisis. Again, these are some of the horrible realities of climate change. The fact that those who are 
least responsible for this crisis are the ones most impacted by it and the fact that those who are most impacted by it they are the ones who don't make it on the news whose stories are not being listened to while the african continent or the global south in general is on the front lines of the climate crisis it is not on the front pages of the world's newspapers and many young people who are organizing uh, from africa they found themselves removed from conversations removed from rooms removed from pictures and not being able to attend conferences you know like the previous the recent cop 26 in glasgow but we cannot have climate justice if the voices of the most affected people and communities are not being listened to. Climate justice will only be justice if all voices are included, if all stories are included, if all experiences are included, because the story of the global south is not the story of the global north. The global north may think that achieving 1.5 is the ultimate survival for all of us. But it's sad to say that in many countries in the global south, 1.2 degrees is already hell for so many communities. So there is a need to listen to every story. There is a need to listen to every experience. There is a need to listen to every community. And we continue to demand for climate justice through organizing and mobilizing different strikes through climate education, because we believe it's important to communicate the crisis and for more people to learn about the environment and how or what role they can play in ensuring that we have a safe planet. And we continue to do different grassroots projects, be it bringing water to our communities or solar panels or eco-friendly cookstoves to our communities, because we believe that even in those small actions, we are transforming the world but much more bigger, we demand for climate justice from the leaders. We demand for real drastic action from the leaders, for the people and also for the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa, for all that you do and for bringing a message of urgency to this question. And it's also important, you know, at this moment to when we look at a continent like Africa to remind ourselves that Africa is the richest continent underneath the ground and that's precisely why we are one of the poorest continents above the ground and what is called the resource curse. Um, uh, for example, many people in the world won't have cell phones were it not for the rare earth materials that come out of the Democratic Republic of Congo even though the people in the Democratic Republic of Congo live in absolute poverty in the main. So now from Uganda, let's take a low carbon virtual flight to Accra, Ghana, uh, to our friend who's, we hope the connection is gonna work. Perk Pomei is a Ghanaian environmental activist who is currently the national coordinator of the Ghana Youth Environmental Movement a leading youth-led environment and climate advocacy and campaign group in Ghana. With over six years of experience in environment and climate change advocacy and campaigning, he specializes in youth engagement, digital organizing, and nonviolent direct action. Perk is a profound movement builder whose entry point into activism was through designing media and communication engagement materials and strategies for environmental organizations in Ghana. Perk, with great pleasure, I give you the floor. Yes, thank you. My name is Perk Pomei. I'm a creative, innovative, and a passionate environmental and climate activist with six years of experience in digital mobilizing, movement building, and campaigning. I have a professional background in visual media and communication with eight years of experience designing media assets and marketing materials for environmental groups to assist them to educate, create awareness, and interact with media and public audiences on wide range of environmental and climate issues in Ghana. I work for the Ghana Youth Environmental Movement, GEM, as the national coordinator, which has over 500 registered members, ensuring that projects that we run and activities that we deliver to the youth 
actually make an impact and also align with our five-year strategic plan on the environment and climate change. Over the years, I have experienced and identified quite a number of challenges as um, a national coordinator and also a youth activist. One of the challenges that I have realized in my work is the limited participation of young people in climate actions. And I've always questioned myself, how do we as young people who have the capacity, the tools, empower others and help them gain the necessary knowledge and skills that they need to be able to address environmental issues within their communities. How can we build grassroots movements that are knowledgeable, capable, and well-equipped with prerequisite tools to foment change at local community levels and also participate in the national decision-making that addresses or are targeted at the global climate emergency. One of the ways, one of the things that I have done over the years is to use my influence and my leadership at GEM to organize climate strikes in the country to help mobilize young people and create climate awareness. I led the, the first climate strike in the northern region of Ghana, which is experiencing some of the worst impacts of climate change. This action involved about 200 school children who marched together as part of the global day of action for Fridays for Future movement in September 2018. In 2019, in March, I coordinated a training workshop and mass climate action for about 300 young people from the environmental movement in Ghana and the international youth climate movement. During the UN African Climate Week, March, 2018, March 2018 to 22nd, hosted in Accra. This event was hosted by the government of Ghana in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. As part of my activities to address the challenges I have identified, currently I am leading the scale up of a national environmental leadership program for the next generation of activists in Ghana. The initiative called the Ghana Young Environmentalist Program, JEP, is aimed at training independent young leaders and empowering change makers to tackle Ghana's environmental challenges and engaging decision makers to help address the climate emergency. Launched in 2020, the program has trained more than 200 grassroots activists so far across all the next 16 regions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pomi, for bringing in the West African perspective, which brings the same sense of urgency to the challenges that we face and for the great work that you're doing. And now we move to the US, to Sarah U uh, Odelo, who has spent a career advocating alongside and supporting young organizers from across the United States. Most recently, she was the executive director for the Alliance of Youth Action, the largest youth grassroots organizing network in the United States. In this role, she led a team to move more than $17 million to state-based organizations over four years, supported the training and capacity of young leaders and organizations, and supported young people to reach the highest voter turnout ever in 2020. Sarah's passion is centering and uplifting young people, particularly young people of color, in progressive movements and institutions. She is originally from Bakersfield, California, and lives in Washington, DC. The floor is yours, Sarah. Look forward to your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Friends at School for the invitation to be here. And wow, just to be in this space with these incredible, badass leaders from around the world. Um, like I said, my name is Sarah Dalai, she, her pronouns, and I'm coming in from Washington, D.C. I am officially an old on this panel. I am an uh, emphasis on former youth activist and organizer forever. I was lucky to be organizing alongside my generation for more than 15 years um, before I aged out. Um, 
My organizing home is in the HIV and AIDS community. It's where I learned to organize at the intersection. It's where I learned to center the most marginalized. And most recently, um, I have been doing work alongside many others here in the US as we try to keep together the incredible fragile democracy that we have right now. Um, part of why I've been able to do this work is because I am the product of years of investment in youth organizing. Uh, when, from when I started at a group called Advocates for Youth to my time at the Alliance, um, I literally have had elders and organizations invest in me as a human being, but in other cases, physically give up their seats at powerful decision-making tables to make sure that young people could be heard. And since then, I've been trying to create space for other young people to, to do similar. This has driven my career. Um, and, and I thought what I could do opening this up is just talk about some of the lessons, again, someone who is no longer young myself, but cares so deeply about youth leadership as, as someone who was at those tables and has only been able to continue the work for as long as I have because of how folks have invested in me and how my generation has organized alongside each other. Um, so first, uh, you know, it, it, it is kind of bananas to me, the work that young people have to do to be taken seriously uh, in so much of the organizing that happens. I, I hear folks talk down quite uh, often about the impatience of the next generation as they work to demand change and demand change quickly, when in fact, you know, we should have had many of these wins long time ago. In fact, when a lot of what young people are demanding for are the same similar visions that brought many of us to this fight who have been in it for a long time. When I think about young people and youth organizing, I think about how folks will like look down on transition and how in many youth spaces, we're constantly bringing new leaders into this work. I've seen organizations close their doors because transition was a cornerstone of their work, but it didn't fit into the right philanthropic model about what it meant to invest in the next generation. The thing is that young people fuel the bench in the work. They may start out youth organizing, but end up in a million other places in our jobs to support them, to invest in their leadership and their work, to keep them in it for the long run. Because as folks have named, these are long fights that are ahead of us and we need these young voices to stick around with us for the long run. When I think about you know, my generation, everyone was freaked out about millennials when we came on the scene in the 2000s and, and early 2010s. And uh, those young people that I was organizing alongside, my peers, my friends, they are now in the leadership of major foundations. They are serving in Congress here in the United States. They are running the comms teams for major nonprofits. Uh, young people need to be invested in today for their leadership, but also knowing that they will be continuing this work for the long run if we do our jobs and invest in them to keep it in for the long run. We can't freak out with leadership change. We have to celebrate it. We have to welcome new young people into this work. When it's time for folks to leave, uh, we have to make sure that they have a, a place to go, that they have a new organizing path, that they have a new place to, to continue this work in, uh, even though they may no longer be the youth organization we get to know them in. And then finally, um, if we want to get into the questions here and hear from these brilliant, um, my brilliant panelists, I'm constantly reminded of how under-resourced young people are in this work. As a reminder, young people have been at the forefront for change in every major social movement that has happened. And is so commonly said when we're fighting over budget allocations for multilateral organizations that the US budgets reflect our values. So especially for philanthropy on this call and for folks in powerful decision-making places, I ask you, how do your budgets show how the next generation is valued? Many of the organizations that deeply invested in me and my peers and our leadership, uh, and frankly, I bet a lot of them invested in many of y'all as well, they no longer exist. Think back to maybe some of the groups that gave you your first organizing training, um, that maybe if you're in a place where you need to register to vote, helped you do that, that helped teach you how to have a voice in what feels like really scary, powerful places. Do they exist there? Think about your hometown. Where are the organizations that are investing in those young people? My hometown, we didn't really have that um, in Bakersfield, California. It's part of why I left and no young person should ever have to leave their hometown in order to make change in their community, in their country, and in the world. So I hope as we continue this conversation and we hear from these amazing speakers that those, especially with resources, are agitated. Look at your own work 
to reflect on how you're supporting the next generation. How are you showing up as allies, as partners, as co-conspirators to the incredible young people who are on this call and in your own communities? And then let's like come up with new ideas on how we can actually do powerful multi-generational organizing work, which in many cases could be like the Black Women Elders in my community did for me, created, they stepped aside and created space. They challenged me to give to the next generation and then also make sure I step aside and give space for young people to take my seat at the tables or in many cases, even better, just like throw the tables out the window and create more space for, for all. So with that, um, can we want to pass it back to you? And I'm so excited to dig in with uh, these incredible panelists. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you so much for that inspiring presentation, but especially I want to say the passion with which you talk about the centrality of youth participation, even if you are timed out or aged out, as you uh, as you say, I'm glad you haven't forgotten from where you come from. I always tell a story about my first protest when I was 15 years old, uh, marching against inequality in education, where the slogan at the front of the march was, we want equality, we want equality. By the time the slogan got to the back of the march, the even younger kids were chanting, we want a color TV, we want a color TV, because they thought that's what the slogan in the front of the march was. <laughs> the truth, truth be told, I wanted a color TV and equality equally at that point. But uh, thank you so much uh, also for reminding us that there's a need for new ideas, right? And we are now going to open up for questions. And while we're waiting for questions to come, I'm going to just share with you a little poem that I wrote during lockdown called, We Are All Desperate to Get Back to Normal, But Should We? Normal. What an average word. So uninspired, it's actually absurd. In a time when we have been forced to change our ways, to pause and isolate and dream of better days, that we'd ever yearn for the world of yesteryear, a world so divided, so fragmented by fear, it's mind-boggling at best that we might just blow Mother Nature's test, longing for the same madness that put us in this global sadness, of me first and screw you and buy forth for the price of two. Surely, getting back to normal can't be our aim after all the sacrifices death and pain. Yes, this pandemic has brought us to our knees, cutting jobs and highlighting inequality. Our leaders are exposed and the broken systems they have imposed are now obviously not making sense. So why do we obsess and resist what needs to be? The end to these failed economic schemes and political machines that weaken and divide, leaving only the elite satisfied. No, we have to be better than this. And if not for ourselves, we must for our kin, our children, and their children, and the ones after them. Thankfully, our youth has far more motivation to take action and year end the years of frustration by breaking down the walls we've created and the inequality that is so outdated. So now, what are you going to do? Let's hope it is something substantially new to keep building post-corona, a human existence that is far from over. Learning from our lessons, respecting all persons, especially our healthcare and essential workers who were invisible to too many of us before this pandemic. And again, lest we forget what and who really matters, even when all hope scatters. Because this tragedy surely must be our big opportunity to look beyond what has always been and build a world that we can thrive in. Thank you for allowing me to share that with you. So we have questions that are coming in. I'm going to take the first two, uh, first two and then first two or three, and then I'll share it with the panel. Alison says, I would love to hear from the activists rather than striking what is the call to the education sector to support the activism? What role does education play in the campaign and their ambitions? Great question. The second question is from Nicole Demestias. Says, I'm curious to hear from you 
how experienced, how you experience, great question coming up, <laughs> how you experience large non-governmental organizations that are child and youth focused can continue to shift power and support the great work you are doing. Are there specific tools, skills, networks, connections, resources you need, want that you can accelerate your aims? And I'll take the third question from Michelle Platone. I would love to hear ideas about what ways to build a movement for immigrant justice. I am a law professor and recently launched an online certificate program to empower people to become advocates for immigrant justice. I find that there are many people who are eager to put their passions to work for refugees and immigrants. So those are the three questions. Don't feel obliged to answer all three. Uh, Perk, do you want to kick us off? Choose whichever question you feel most moved yes. to answer. I would want to respond to Alison. So um, as part of our activities at GEM, we don't um, only strike. We conduct research activities to provide insights to some of the activities we run, like campaigning and also policy advocacy. We also do training through workshops where we empower young people. So like I mentioned, we train young people through the Ghana Young Environmentalist Program to provide them the necessary skills. So rather than striking, we use various forms to equip young people, not just with their skills, but also knowledge base for them to be able to implement change and also achieve behave, behavioral changes through their lifestyles as environmental activists or grassroots activists, which is also very important. So education also plays a key role, which is why GEM also through um, effort developed the green clubs in schools curriculum. So which is a curriculum being used to educate young people in senior high schools and junior high schools, and even to some youth groups who are using this curriculum as a resource, are adapting it to engage even those in the lower primary, the much younger target groups on activity-based learning on environmental issues. So they learn through fun, they learn through uh, practices. They also acquire certain skills like journalism, research skills, observation skills. And um, we also apply various um, interactive and fun ways of learning through the real pedagogies and also create an opportunity for young people to not just learn about the environment, but also learn about the environment in their context. So using African traditional knowledge values and systems to educate young people on uh, environmental issues and also help them identify simple and basic resources and tools within their daily life activities to be able to address some of these issues. So um, these are some of the rules activities we have engaged and these are the roles in places to equip young people, give them the knowledge base and also help us achieve behavioral change in their lifestyles as young people. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Perk. Perk, you know why I came to you first, right? Because yeah. for some gender balance on the panel, because you and I are yeah, mainly because to provide gender balance. Eh? <laughs> so Thanks. anyway, let me, let me go to Nicole, uh, sorry, to Sarah, who has kindly uh, volunteered to lead off on Nicole's question. Yeah, Nicole, it's such a great question. And I have to say, as someone who's worked within youth programs of organizations that are largely run by folks that are older and also worked with youth run organizations, you know, the dream is young people running their own organizations. And I think these panelists are incredible examples of what can happen when young people are running the show. I also know that's not the reality for, for all non um, NGOs out there. And so what I would say is that, um, you know, making sure that if there is, you want to have space for young people to lead their own programmatic work. Um, you want to make sure they have their own budget. You want to make sure they're invested in as part of the core of the organization. And 
I think it's really important and something that's become one of my big passions is about board development and making sure that young people are serving on boards of directors. And it's not just saying, here is a youth place. This young person will be in the room while we're talking about all these things, but it's actually deeply investing in them to make sure they understand governance stra like strategies and structures, to make sure they understand are in the weeds of the budget. They have the tools to ask key questions about how are resources being spent in this in this organization? Are we comfortable with how resources are being spent across programs to really agitate and ask those questions? And that doesn't come typically from one young person being on the boards. It comes from multiple, um, especially when you have a youth program, you've invested in young people. It's such a great opportunity to then put them as part of your organizational pipeline to be in the leadership, whether it's on the staff side or on the board side. And so um, an organization that uh, I, I came from and would not be here without uh, does both US-based and global work, Advocates for Youth has, I think, done some really great work on um, investing in program for young people within the organization um, and also having alumni serve on boards. And so those are I think, two things that are particularly important um, as you know, young people serving on boards, it's an important lesson for the work then, but then also as they move to run to their own organizations, managing above budget, dealing with governance structures. That's not always what we're teaching as part of this work, but it's really important to make sure we're reflecting our values, we're reflecting our communities, et cetera. So that's what I'd toss in there. Thank you, Sarah, so much for that. Um, Vanessa, would you like to pick up Michelle's question? Yes, uh, thank you. Speaking from the climate perspective, I know that uh, we cannot have climate justice without immigrant justice because we know how much the climate crisis is accelerating uh, many challenges that lead people uh, to seek refuge in different places. And as these disasters continue to happen and people lose their homes or people lose their schools or people lose their livelihoods, I believe that, you know, people are looking for, you know, hope that has been destroyed because of the climate crisis. People are looking for hope that has been taken away because of the, you know, the climate disasters. People are seeking to you know, find their livelihoods that have been lost because of the climate crisis. So I think it's really about understanding the intersection of many of these challenges. And, you know, for people to understand that even if your focus is on the climate movement, it goes beyond, you know, the rise in global temperatures. It goes to uh, poverty eradication. It goes to gender equality or achieving zero hunger or ensuring there is immigrant justice. So I think it's just important to understand how all these challenges are interconnected and a fight for one is a fight for all of them. Thank you, thank you Vanessa, for reminding us that one of the things we critically need to do is turbocharge intersectionality. Uh, that's been missing for far too long. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Anna. Anna, before I turn to you, though, I just want to say that there are two more questions that have come in. I'm just, just going to re read them just in case you want to also kick off with answering some of them as well as reflections on the earlier questions. The next question is from Jessica Jacobson. Uh, a question for any of the activists. What have you learned about power in your work? And what has surprised you most about how power works? I can see Sarah last month got such a big smile on her face. I can see there's some good and bad experience that is coming out from your smiles there, Sarah. Uh, it works. And how can you take it and wield it? Uh, then we have Amelia Underwood King. And she says, as a fellow activist, I would love to hear the panel's advice for using modern technology with uh, such a social media in a way that brings about genuine change rather than simply tokenistic action. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. I want to comment on a few of the things that were said before and then address this last questions. In, in relation to education and to educational institutions, um, I actually have a, a, quite, quite a, a different reflection, uh, more than just a place to learn things. I, I see educational institutions as a place of encounter, of ideas, of thought. So uh, it's no surprise that many of the movements worldwide start with universities and with 
schools. Uh, and in that sense, that's because you meet people and um, that people are there to think, to reflect. And in that sense, it's such a powerful thing. And I, I make this reflection because nowadays uh, we are seeing how education is shifting uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And there is not that much need for the content to be placed in person, but there is a need for connection and that I wouldn't trade for anything. Uh, regarding to the experience with, with large NGOs, I see it as a double-edged -edge sword. Uh, as Sarah was saying, it, it can be so powerful to have someone backing you up and, and, and providing um, a place for you to have action. But in that sense, if it's a, an established umbrella that doesn't let you grow and doesn't let you go further than that, uh, then it's cutting your wings. A little bit. So, so, so my advice for both large organizations and to activists will be to think about transcending that type of relation. It's, it's not you teaching activists something, it's you going alongside with activists into promoting something. And in that sense, you need to give the opportunity to the activists to grow and not just constantly depending on you as a third party. And that particularly refers to funding opportunities and to decision making. Um, now going to the, the last two that were mentioned regarding power, I see that the relationship with power that I've experienced is relative and it's temporary. Uh, you have a different set of, of, of power on your hands and at each stage of your movement, but it, that doesn't mean that uh, you are more or less effective. So instead of power, I will focus on influence. How are you able to influence um, the decision making? How are you able to influence what's happening around you to influence people? So in that sense, uh, power just by itself, it comes and goes, but influence is something you build and it's something we can help activists build together. And uh, regarding modern technology, uh, as, as the last point I will mention that I find it more more helpful to focus on public participation through modern technology, not just building something of one-sided interaction. The, the, the intelligent thing about the technology is that it's a two-way thing uh, and it connects. So if we don't, we're, if we're not connecting, if we're just laying information there, we're not doing anything. And also we need to always think about accessibility. Not everyone can access an app. Uh, not everyone can access uh, maybe something beautiful you made, but that it's extremely heavy and in need of large internet connections. So in that sense, everything we do regarding technology should be accessible, should involve participation, and should be something not only informative, but that connects and recollects ideas. Wow, that was such a brilliant response. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I mean, this panel, uh, is a reminder uh, collectively why young people must refuse to accept this oft quoted thing by adults when they say young people are leaders of tomorrow. The reality is if young people do not assert leadership today and bring in new fresh lenses of leadership, there might very well not be a tomorrow for young people to access, uh, exercise any leadership. So uh, we are out of time, but I'm going to give the other panelists one minute each to reflect on the last two questions, if they might. Perk, would you like to go next? Yes, uh, I would like to take uh, a question on the using of modern technology, such as social media. So um, my entry point into activism was through media and communication, and also using my creative skills to support environmental movement and also to help um, create messages of very interactive and engaging context that speaks to people's emotion and also brings conversation between this environmental space into the public domain and this has been possible because I uh, have been very achievable due to social media so I think it's also important for us as activists and grassroots to also leverage the power of digital platforms to promote our work and also to help reach out to more wider audience 
and um, also hold leaders accountable because these leaders also leverage the platform of social media to engage citizens. So you as an activist also need to use that platform to engage others also. Thank you. Thanks. Sarah, one minute to you. Uh, I am just like so honored to have been in the space of these incredible leaders. And hopefully we can be in person at a world forum in the future because, you know, technology like this is so great, again, to just like Perk said, to like spread ideas, right? To start to widen our base because at the end of the day, right, the goal is to continuously bring people into the work. But wow, face-to-face -face is so important. And that's why I just continuously want to underscore the importance of young people having their own political homes that they are running in their communities, uh, that they are in charge of the program and the budget and the vision. That is what is so needed across the world because that is how change happens. Is we're actually in relationship to each other when we're being real about the hard times, but also able to celebrate the good that this work is rough. But we need to have cookouts and kickbacks and we need to dance and be joyful. And yeah, you could do a little bit of that online. But as we learned during the pandemic, it is so important for that to happen in person. So for those who have resources and have power that can be shared, you got like you got to do it. You got to do it. We have these incredible leaders, and so many who are at this world forum and not um, who are, you know, they're like they're putting the work in right now. And it's up to us to create space for them and invest in them because it's actually better for our future when they are the ones in charge. Thank you, Sarah. Vanessa, your one minute. Thank you. Uh, when I think about the issue of power, I'm just thinking about how collective we can make power to be. And instead of power being uh, revolved around just one person, I think it gets very problematic and challenging in a movement. And it's really good to make power as collective you know, as possible, to have that unity and to understand that the power of the people is greater than the power of an individual. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That's such a perfect point for me to round up. I, if I can take it even one step further by saying that we also have to create spaces and an infographic is going to go up now for you to look at this, where we also look at individuals, as some of you said, and create agency for individuals, even if they are not formally within movements at the starting point of their engagement. Because I think one of the downsides of activism has been that because we focus so much on how people are exploited, marginalized, oppressed, excluded, and so on, which we need to do, that sometimes unwittingly, we forget that notwithstanding all of that that has been done to people, people still have humongous agency. Right, so people still have creativity. People still have capability to make a difference, and therefore we have the reason to have a very uh, cautious optimism that even though things look tragically challenging, that things can turn around. And in this infographic, which I will ask for you to be shared, People's Power to Global Justice was trying to do putting people back at the center read every circle from the center, looked at four areas, harnessing our autonomy, harnessing our creative participation, our consumption, and our wealth, and trying to see how we can bring all of this to bear. The challenge for us right now is to take seriously what Albert Einstein once said, when he said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. Now is the time for us to look critically at what we have done in the past, what worked, what didn't work, for us not to be precious about logos and uh, you know egos and leg personal and in organizational legacies. There's much too much at stake. So I'd like to end with the words of Martin Luther King in that context. Speaking in 1965, when I was about four months old, he said, my friends, as I come to the end of my speech, I want to note in the field of modern child psychology, there's a very dominant term called maladjusted. Now, all of us want to live a well-adjusted life and not suffer from schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. 
But my friends, I say to you, there are certain things in our world that are so immoral and unjust that good, decent people should refuse to be well adjusted to. Then he goes on to say, and I would intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry, to racial discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to the mindless expenditure on military weapons when people don't have food to work, eat. And on the economy, he said, I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. Now, while he was talking about the U.S. in the mid-60s, that's a thousand times more relevant to the U.S. today as it is relevant in every single country uh, you know, uh, in the world. In a longer version of the speech, he said, and I call upon decent men and women around the world to come together to set up a new international organization, which wasn't formed, by the way, to be known as the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. So, my dear panelists, I applaud you for being creatively maladjusted. I applaud you for not uh, adjusting to a broken status quo. I applaud you for uh, not taking the approach that our governments did after the global financial crisis, which was all about system recovery, system protection, and system maintenance. Because what you say to the world through your work is what is needed is system innovation, system redesign, and system transformation. Muchas gracias. Merci beaucoup, Asante Sana, Sheshe, Spasiba. Thank you very, very much for your participation.